Hey, good morning and welcome again to Discovery Church. Man, we got a full house this holiday weekend. Amen. You guys don't like the beach? You guys like church better? Huh? Church is better than the beach, amen? No, no. Oh, wow, you guys are saints of God in the house today. Well, I didn't know I'd get anything from that. I thought it would be quiet right there. But man, I'm glad you guys are joining us for the final installment of this Galatian series. And um, if you have been trekking along with us, uh, man, this has been just a foundational series. It's, it's a foundational series for if you're a new believer or if you're just a believer at all in Christ. This is foundational teaching of what does it mean to follow Christ. Uh, if you miss any of these, man, um, come, watch them back on YouTube because not only are they foundational for your Christian walk and, and for solid doctrine, but there are foundational teachings here at Discovery Church, some bedrock principles that we kind of get behind. We always kind of reteach because um, we believe they're very important and valuable. So we're in the sixth installment, the final installment. What we've been doing in Galatians is just taking a chapter at a time in the verses and, and just explaining those and diving into God's word. And the, the subtext or the subline of this series of this book, Galatians, is how to be free. So the Apostle Paul, who's the author of this letter, it's, it's a letter written to the churches in Galatia, churches that he started and planted and kind of moved on. Um, he's writing them because there is a little bit of disunity, a little bit of dissension. They're kind of going back into an old, dead religion kind of flow relationship with God. It isn't even really a relationship. It's kind of like a duty. It's just religion. And they're getting away from this personal, intimate Savior that Paul introduced them to. This, and they had the joy of God in their life. They had salvation. They were free in Christ. And, and, and they even knew that they were filled with God's Spirit, that's like the, the, the big thing of the New Testament, really, of this, this new church was that, man, God just doesn't fill a few people. He doesn't just empower a few people, but God can live inside every single one of you, and He does live inside of you. When you accept Christ, He lives and gives and empowers and equips you to do life and accomplish His purpose for your life. And so they had this at one point, and then they kind of started drifting back into into dead religion rules, and, and what happened was uh, just some, some new Christians, they were all new Christians at this point, but they were Jewish Christians, came into Galatia, and they just started telling them things like, you know, uh, you guys are following Jesus, it's great, but, but you need to follow the rules as well, so you need to do this whole circumcision thing, and we got all these rules, that you also need to follow, or else you're just not right with God, and so Paul is, is kind of frustrated, because that's not how he left them, and they started, they just followed along, started doing those things, and that's not how Paul left them, Paul left them free, Paul left them full of the Spirit of God, doing the mission that God called them to do. I mean, this is, this is a New Testament church, and so, so uh, the, the New Testament church was about what? It was about the final command of Jesus. Go and make disciples of all nations. Like every church, every, every believer knew that. It was, it was fresh. It was the command. It was the mission of every person, of every church, was to seek and to save that which was lost. There was this missional heartbeat, a part of the early church that was empowered by the Holy Spirit. Paul sees him drifting away and he writes a little, a frustrated letter and he, and he kind of has given them the ingredients now to come back to freedom. And so we've studied some things throughout the chapters like, like living in grace and understanding what grace is and, 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 and um, living in relationship to God and not in religion. There's a difference between religion and relationship and that God is actually giving you this spirit that, that it's a spirit of adoption that makes you a son and a daughter and a co-heir with Christ. And that, that these are things he's saying, I need, to get, I need to reteach you some things. You're a co-heir, you're a son, you're a daughter. He's your daddy. He's not just your God. He's not just your deity up there, but he's your daddy that wants to live in you and move through you and, and, and for you to walk in the power of the Spirit. That, that these are all ingredients for you to be free and and, and, and it's for freedom that Christ has set you free. This is the whole deal, man. You were supposed to be free, and you're, you're, you're losing it now. And so in this final installment, in this last chapter, Paul is going to introduce to us another, another ingredient of, of freedom, of, of how to be free and remain free in your walk with Christ. And it's one that's very it's, it's unexpected. So, so I want to back up to Galatians 5 because it's, it's, again, oftentimes Paul will in his writings, he'll introduce something in, in a previous chapter, he'll just kind of sneak it in there, and then he'll expand on it kind of later. It's just his style of writing. So let me show you in Galatians chapter 5 where Paul introduces this, this sixth component that we're going to talk about today, this ingredient of your freedom. Man, I hope you catch this today. I want you free. How many of you want to live free today? You want to live free? Amen. 
Here it is. Here's, let, me, let me give you the kind of Galatians 5 where Paul just introduces this component. He says, you were running a good race. He's talking to the Galatian Christians here. You guys were running a good race. You were, you were on track. You were full of God. You were walking in grace and freedom, living in the Spirit. Man, you were running a good grace. Who cut in on you and kept you from obeying the truth that I left you with? There's a different truth you started buying into. It's not the gospel. It's, it's a different truth, he's saying. And then he says this little phrase, a little yeast works through the whole batch of dough. Well, you get a little bit of false doctrine, just a little bit of false teaching, just, just a little bit of that dead religion and, and a little bit of that carnal flesh nature. It's going gonna, it's gonna to hurt your entire body. It'll hurt not only your entire personal body, but he's talking to the church. He's saying, you get a little bit of that in, in your church, it's going to work through. And so Paul's, he's going to tell us how to address that in just a moment. We'll come back to that. You, my brothers, were called to be free. Man, God, God wants you free. He doesn't want you a slave. He didn't want slaves. He wants sons and daughters. But do not use your freedom to indulge the sinful nature. Rather, and this is where Paul introduces the sixth topic of this series, how to be free, to, and I'm calling it today, live to make a difference. Live to make a difference. He says, serve one another in love. And this is one of the, one of the components of our freedom that you, would, it's, it's, you wouldn't think. It's unexpected. But Paul is, 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 is telling us here that, that in, if you want to be free, if you want to walk in freedom and continue in freedom, then, then you need to learn how to serve one another in love. And, and the reason why Paul does not, not give this earlier to the church, like maybe earlier on the letter, first, second, third chapter, is because if, if, if he would have given this to us or to the church earlier, then they would have looked at it and go, oh, that's just another rule to, I need to follow. Oh, I just got, okay, now I got to do something. Okay, now I got I, I, I to add that to my list of things I got to do. Now I got to do stuff for God or do stuff for people, which is, it's, it's, that's again, that's dead religion. So what Paul had to do is get you, get this church to understand grace, get this church to understand who their father, daddy is and who they are in relationship to him. Get them to walk in the spirit. And if you do, if you're walking in the spirit and in freedom, the outflow of that is this. You you serve one another in love. That's the outflow. But you need to make that choice. You have to choose your freedom. Again, it's your choice. You have to choose your freedom and that this may be an element that so many people, they, they, have, a, they have some of their freedom is blocked up, it's held up. It's, you, you're never going to, let me say it this way, you're never going to experience the full breadth of your freedom in Christ until you learn how to do this, until you learn how to serve one another in love. And so Paul is, is, is again, he's, he's a little bit frustrated because because, man, I left, you, I left you on mission. I left you, and you knew that this is what you were called to do. So he says, you guys were doing great. Let's get back to freedom where we serve God out of internal motivation of the Spirit, not out of duty. Okay? So let me, Galatians chapter 6 now, where Paul now introduces, and, and kind of expands a little more on this making a difference lifestyle. Uh, picking up at verse 7, he says, Do not be deceived. God cannot be mocked. A man reaps what he sows. And then he, he kind of, he says a scripture that a lot of you are familiar with. Or you're familiar with this principle. You're familiar with this concept. But I want to I show you something about this scripture that maybe you've never seen in the context that Paul says it in. That maybe you'll never see this verse the same. Again, here's what Paul says. He says, whoever sows to their flesh from the flesh will reap destruction. But whoever sows to please the spirit from the spirit will reap destruction eternal life now this is important what paul says next it's directly connected to that principle of sowing and reaping to the flesh and the spirit so let us not become weary in doing good for at the proper time we're going to reap a harvest the harvest that god told us we would get he's going to give it to us if we don't give up so here's, here's, here's the, the connection. Yes, this principle of, of sowing to the flesh and reaping to the flesh and sowing to the Spirit, reaping the Spirit results, the fruit of the Spirit or eternal life, that'll apply in a lot of different ways. But what Paul is actually talking about here in the context, he's actually saying, if you sow to yourself, meaning your selfishness, if, you, if, if all you are about in your life is about your life, if all you're about is, is pleasing yourself, serving yourself, doing what you want to do, how you want to do it, and when you want to do it, then you're going to reap destruction, Paul is saying. If that's going to be your life, then you're, not, you're going to reap destruction. But those who live in the Spirit, those who walk in the Spirit, will reap eternal life. 
this is, this is the connection Paul is, is, is making here. Is that, look, you're, if you want to be free, Galatian church, if you want to be new, free, new believer, then you need to learn how to walk in the Spirit and serve one another in love. And then he says, therefore, as we have an opportunity, let's do good to all people. And I can, I can see Paul, who's like this missionary heart, right? This, he's like, man, there's a, there's a harvest out there. There's a mission field that's out there and you guys are kind of talking about rules and, and religion and dead stuff and things that don't matter and your inward bickering. And, and, and the, but there's a harvest that's out there, man. There's so much opportunity that is out there to do good and to make a difference. But I need you to get free first so you can make a difference. And this is the whole, I believe, the whole point of Paul like writing this letter. It's like, yes, I want you free and I want you understanding grace and I want you walking in the fullness of the Spirit so that God's purposes can be fulfilled in your life, so that you can make a difference for God's kingdom, for his glory. And then he says this really interesting last sentence there, therefore we have an opportunity, let, let us do good to all people. Then he says, especially to those who belong to the family of believers. I think it's really interesting that Paul kind of added that in there. He's like, hey, let's do good. Let's go make a difference, guys. Let's go out there. There's an opportunity. There's a harvest. But, but make sure you don't forget about loving the person you're sitting next to. But make sure you don't, you don't forget about like forgiving, like walk in forgiveness and walk in grace towards the world and let's go reach the world. But make sure you forgive the person sitting behind you too, okay? Don't forget about that. Especially, especially to those who belong to this thing called the body of Christ, the, the family of believers. And the reason why, as we've been studying, Paul has to say this is because there was a little bit of disunity. There was a little bit of, of dissension in the, in the ranks of this church because some of them had dead religion going on. Some of them had some carnal nature stuff going on. And Paul had to bring a little bit of correction. He says, man, I want you walking in freedom. You know, and it, but, but it, it makes no good if you're out there making a difference, doing all you can, yet you're not, you're not living in freedom in, in the house. You're not walking with your brothers and sisters in freedom and in, re in, 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 in relationship with them in freedom. It doesn't make any difference. So he says, hey, especially to those who belong to the family of believers. So what I thought I'd do today is I want to I teach you how to, how to live your life to make a difference. And really, and, and if you grab hold of the truths I'm going to share with you today, you're going to experience a whole new level of freedom. If, you've, if you have not uh, made your life and done this, this whole serving others in love and allowing the spirit of God that dwells in you to move through you now and bless others and be a blessing, man, I'm telling you, you'll experience a whole nother freedom. I want to teach you how to do that. But let me give you first these three points that Paul kind of is making. Let me summarize his three points about we need to, we need to get some things right here first. Come on, church, we need to get some things right. We need to get, work out our freedom, work out our relationships so we can go out there and make a difference. So let me summarize these three points, and I just called it to the church on mission. I see Paul's heart going, man, I want you on mission. I want you making a difference, but I need, I need, to, I need to shift you just a little bit, okay, because some, some people cut in on you, and you were running a good race, but, but man, you need, to, you need to get back on track. So, so let me give you just three points from Paul's heart on getting back on track. Here they are. Number one, I believe Paul would tell us, if he was like here today, at a, what he would tell us is walk in love, not an offense. Walk in love, not in offense. Offense is something that will rob you of your joy, rob you of your purpose, rob you of, of the community, of the fellowship of God's people. It'll, it'll rob you. Offense, someone said that offense, the offended heart is the breeding ground of deception. It's, 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 where, it's where the enemy comes in and says and, and starts whispering in your ear and causing, causing you to look at things and judge things. And this is what the Galatian church was doing. The Galatian church was like having inward battles. They were focusing on who's, do, who's doing the rules and who's not doing the rules, who's doing it right and who's doing it wrong. And Paul comes in and says, stop it. Just, just walk in love, not in offense. Galatians 5 and 14, he says, the entire law is summed up in a single command. And I'm telling you, if, if we were walking in this single, in this singular command that the entire, you know, living for God is summarized, you would not take, you could not take offense on anything anyone would do to you, ever. If you would just love your neighbor as yourself. So Paul says, I want you walking in freedom, but there's something robbing your freedom. You need to learn how to walk in love, 
not in offense. A very cool Proverbs chapter 19, verse 11. It says that sensible people control their temper. They earn respect by overlooking offenses. See, that's how respect is earned. That's how, that's how we grow in stature. Not by criticizing or pointing things out, but we grow in our, in our wisdom and stature by actually overlooking the wrong and overlooking the offense. Okay, we want to get back to freedom, and I hope that any of these points may minister to some of you or any of you, any one of these. If you want to get back to freedom, get off of that offense track and start loving your neighbor as yourself. How do you judge yourself? Well, you, 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 uh, you judge your, your own actions by your intentions and, and, and other people by their actions. So you give yourself liberty and give yourself room, but no one else. Love, start loving others like you love yourself that way. Give them grace. Give them forgiveness. Give them, give them the benefit of the doubt. Walk in love, not in, the, not in the fence. Here's the second thing that Paul is telling us, and that is to gently correct the spirit of religion and the flesh. And we talked about these in previous series. If you miss it, you got to go check those out. But, but it gently, you know what? True love, true love, if you really love somebody, you'll tell them the truth. But you'll tell them the truth in love. Okay, it'll be gent, gent, true love will, will tell someone and, and make them aware of the trap that they're in, of the danger that is before them. Gently correct the spirit of religion and the flesh. I believe true love does that. True love doesn't let our friends stay in deception. Galatians chapter 6 is where Paul says, brothers and sisters, if someone is caught in a sin, you who live by the spirit, meaning you who are free, you're walking in the spirit, you should restore that person gently. You want, it, and that's the key word there is gently. Gently. You know, you, listen, please listen. You cannot, you cannot gently restore somebody or bring any type of correction of restoration into their life if you don't know them personally. If you're not in relationship with them. If you haven't built trust with that person, you can't do that gently. You can't. Because you know what, I'll preach this and I'll talk about this and I know I've even heard some people actually think they have the gift of criticism. Like it's a gift. Like they can see everything, everyone's wrong. And like, and like they, I, I just, oh, I just, God, give me that gift. I can just see every, uh, what's wrong and what's not wrong. Come, that is not a gift of the Holy Spirit. I am so sorry. That is not, okay? That's, you, cannot, you cannot gently restore someone you don't even know and you're not doing life with. That's, you, you can't do that. That's why small groups are so huge at Discovery because every one of us are going to, we have this kind of, this, this propensity or this, 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 we all slide one way or the other. We'll slide to religion and just start doing things out of duty instead of delight, instead of a relationship. Or we'll, some of us maybe slide towards our sin nature a little bit. Every one of us slide. Don't act like you don't. Every one of you do. And you need people around you who can gently come along you and say, hey, can I tell you something? I see something. I need, can I help you out? How do you know if it's actually gently? How do you know if you're, if you're doing it for the right reasons and it's gentle? It's this last sentence. It says, carry each other's burdens, and in this way you fulfill the law of Christ. You want gentle? Gentle is, hey, man, I, when you said that, I, there was this attitude that was there, and I just want to, I want you to know, though, I got your back. I you, hey, I saw this going on. I know, I, know you're, I know you're messing up with this, man. And you're, I want you to know I'm here for you. I'm not going to give up on you. I'm going to carry that burden with you. And I'm going to walk with you through that. Hey, man, you're going to be free. I'm, I'm never going to give up on you, man. That is the gentle restoration of a brother or sister in Christ. That, that, is, that is how you know it is gentle, is where, is where you come alongside them and you say, not only am I going to show you this, but I'm going to help you carry that load. That looks heavy. I'm here for you. Let me walk with you. Let me walk with you through this to freedom, okay? I'm not going to leave you there. I am here for you. You don't tell them, point them out and tell them how jacked up they are. Drop the mic on them. And, eh, eh. That's, not, that's not the spirit of Christ. That isn't. Gently, gently correct that spirit of religion and the flesh. I mean, that's what love, 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 love restores. It doesn't let it. Now, this is where Paul, because Paul said a little yeast will ruin the whole dough. Ruin the whole, the whole, the whole batch. So, so you're in, you're in circles of influence, and you see someone just, man, they're falling back, they're slipping. And some people slip either towards the carnal nature or religion, and they get, they're slipping, and you see it, man, speak up, carry that burden with them. That's why, that's, that's why Paul is saying, do good as you have every opportunity, but especially 
to those who are your brothers and your sisters, if you see them sliding, carry that load with them. Gently correct and restore the spirit of religion and the flesh. Here's the third thing that Paul is saying. If you want to walk in freedom, man, we've got to, we got to get back on track, church, he's saying. Don't compare or compete with others, but compliment them. Don't compare or compete with others, but compliment them. Meaning, compliment meaning not like tell them they're doing a great job and they look handsome today or something. Compliment them by meaning come alongside them. Complete them. You see, they're, they're only a part of the body of Christ. You are, and you are a part of the body of Christ. And we are not to compete or compare, but we're to compliment each other. This is where Galatians 6, 3, Paul says, If anyone thinks that they are something when they're not, they deceive themselves. Each one should test their own actions. They shouldn't be judging someone else's actions. You test your own actions. Then they can take pride in themselves alone without comparing themselves to someone else. For each one should carry their own load. This idea of complimenting each other and, and that you, have, you are part of the body and, and I'm part of the body and we're all, we're, all kind of, we're all not complete pictures of the body and the nature of Christ, but we all are to complement each other. How do we do that? How do we complement each other? Through the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Through the gifts that He's given us. God has given all of us different gifts that complement each other. This is what the Bible says about that. 1 Corinthians chapter 12. It says a spiritual gift is given to each one of us, to every one of us. Every one of us who's a believer has a spiritual gift. God puts difference-making ingredients inside of each of us, inside of each and every one of us. Why? So that we can compare with other people? No. No. Why? So we can help each other. See, the gift that you have has an assignment attached to it. And I personally believe that the enemy will do everything he can to make sure that you never experience the freedom that God has for you when you identify and use your gift to make a difference in this world. I believe he's been doing this all throughout time, trying to prevent those who have the fullness or the gifts of the Spirit from using their gifts. See, in the Old Testament, when the Spirit of God was on someone, they were only on a special group of people. It was the priests. So the Spirit of God was, was, was on the priest, but something amazing happened when Jesus paid our debt. The Bible says that the, the veil was torn and that the Spirit of God was poured out on all believers, on all flesh, and that we now have, we are temples of the Holy Spirit, and we have the gifts of the Holy Spirit living within us. I mean, it's no longer just on a special people or a special group, but it's it's the power of God lives inside of each individual. And when this happened, when the, when the Spirit of God was poured out, it amazed everybody. Because this was news like, man, no one, no one walked in that kind of, no one walked in the Spirit like that. And even non-Jewish people were full, filled with the Spirit and had the gifts of the Spirit. And it amazed people. It amazed them. But as soon as the early church age was kind of over, they all, you know, the church started hiring special people um, again, and they gave them terms that are not even in the Bible, like clergy. Like they, they said, they said, okay, you're going to be the professional minister, and you're going to have all the gifts and all the service and all that stuff is going to is going to flow through you, and you're the clergy. Which clergy is not even in the Bible. It's not a biblical term. It's not an Old Testament, New Testament. All it, all it means is one who one who reads. And they said, look, you're going to be the one who has all the gifts. And and the church, what the church did is they sat on the sidelines. And they even came up for another term of people who weren't ministers or weren't clergy. They, they called them laymen. You ever heard that before? Laymen? Yeah, and that's all they did, too. They just laid around, did nothing, man. They were just lay, nothing. They, just, they were not operating within the gifts that God gave them. They weren't doing anything. But then, let me give you a little history now, okay? Then in the 1500s, this is important. This is important for you to understand. In the 1500s, something happened called the Protestant Reformation. And the Protestant Reformation happened in Europe at that time because of this one discovery, this biblical truth that we're going to talk about today, and that is called the priesthood of all believers. The priesthood of all believers. They, they read their Bibles, go figure, they opened up their Bibles and they started reading it for themselves and they were like, wow, wait a second, wait a minute, like, like this, this, 
this doesn't have to just happen to professional ministers or clergy or reverends. Like, like a, no, the power of God, the presence of God, and the gifts of God can be inside every single one of us. He can live and dwell and empower all of us. And they celebrated that. And it, man, it was an amazing thing. But then eventually they, uh, they just went right back to this idea of two different classes of Christians. Professional and non-professional. And, and some people even, I, I get that sometimes. Some people call me like reverend or treat me differently. And I was out golfing not too long ago. And one of the, my buddies I was golfing with, there was, a, there was a, a cloud that was coming. It was actually several of them. There was a cloud on the horizon. And, and they, they looked at me like, Come on, pastor, pray, pray, pray that, come on, you're the pastor, and I'm like, come on, man, like, 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 and I had to tell him, like, I work in sales, not in management, okay, I don't do weather, I don't manage the weather, okay, that's not my job, and so they think that my prayers are somehow more powerful than, than theirs, and I'm telling you, this is a bedrock principle of the New Testament church, it's a bedrock principle of discovery, I taught this principle the very first year of our church. I looked in the eyes of every person and I said, this church will not look like its pastor. This church does, cannot look like its pastor. This church needs to look like you, the church. It needs to look like the gifts that God has given you. That's what it needs to look like. And, and so I'm not, I'm not like separate from you. I am one of you. I'm just one of the dream team. That's all I, I'm on the dream team with you. I'm one of the dream team just doing what God has gifted and called me to do. That's, that's what I'm doing. I'm just, I'm just one, so we need to do this together as the body of Christ, and I'm just doing my part. I'm doing my, I, I communicate, I cast vision, I lead. That's my part in the body of Christ. But you have gifts inside of you. You have purpose inside of you. Like God deposited purpose and gifts inside of each and every one of you, and I want to help you find it. I want to help you, I want to help you get this level of freedom that you can only get when you're making a difference using the gifts that God has given you. So let me give you the, uh, a definition of spiritual gifts. This is just my definition. This is my definition of spiritual gifts. Write it down this way. A spiritual gift is a special, here's the key word, supernatural ability so when you're doing it you you know god is working in you you know like man this is this is god just working through me i feel that right now as i as i'm communicating to you like man this is god working through you through me and it says uh a spiritual gift is a special supernatural ability that god gives to each of his children so that keyword together together um in other words it's going to work best if we if we all do it, because we're all the body of Christ, and my gift connects and complements somebody else's gift, and what you're going to discover is, using this metaphor of the body, if you discover you're an ear or a hand or whatever, you're going to discover if you're a hand, you don't work very well unless you're connected to the wrist, and, and the wrist needs to find the arm, and the arm needs to find the shoulder, and, and, and we, we, we need to work together, uh, and it doesn't work well unless we are connected together so that we can all do our unique part so that we can here's the other key word advance his purposes in the world in other word uh god's got something he needs us to do we're on assignment we're on mission and and listen we cannot this we cannot accomplish this mission without first discovering that unique thing that's on the inside of us so today, I honor the dream team. I do. All, of, all the dream team today, that, that, that a lot of them aren't even in here today because they're serving elsewhere. They're, they're serving outside. They're serving in kids' ministry. They're, they're sitting with second and third graders right now, um, teaching them the Bible or asking them their prayer needs and praying with them. And, and, and you know they're watching your crying baby right now so we can have quiet in here. Okay? Praise God. That, so they're, in, they're serving behind the scenes. They're, they're in the media team or hospitality team or maybe a, even on the stage on a guitar or something. Each, though, is using their unique gift that God enabled them so that together we can advance God's purposes on this planet. This is a bedrock message of the New Testament. It's a bedrock message of discovery. And that's why, that's why we even have these next step classes that we do. The whole purpose of our next step classes we do every month is to help this reality getting in your life. We want you walking in supernatural power, understanding your unique calling and gifting, and making a difference in this world. 
That's, that's why we do it. That's the, whole, that's the whole reason why. So how do we make a difference then? How do we do it? I'm glad you guys asked. Thanks for asking. It makes it easy when you guys ask like that. So here's some three things. I want to teach you three things to do in order to make live to make a difference. If you want to walk in freedom, man, you can't skip this part. You can't, you can't miss this part of serving others in love, using the gift that God has given you. All right, here it is, three things. Number one, you need to discover that gift that God has given you. Discover that gift. Because chances are, it's not obvious. It's not, too, it's not an obvious thing. Because your spiritual gift, listen, your spiritual gift is not your natural ability. Your spiritual gift is not your natural skill set. You know, I was never a good communicator. Never. I was afraid to talk in front of people. I mean, this wasn't like, a, this wasn't a natural thing that was for me. And I never was like a visionary. I never, I never was like an administrator and can see the, the future. I was in a fog, man. I was living day by day. I didn't, I, I'm telling you, this is, this is a grace work of God. D- God divinely enabled me to do some things. So how do we find that? How do we find that, that, that gift? How do we find it out? Watch this. Romans chapter 12 says that we have different gifts we all have different gifts. And the Bible lists like 27 of them. And they're not even, that's not even all exhaustive. I believe that, that those 27 gifts that the Bible lists, that's not exhaustive. I believe that God is continuously giving new gifts to reach a new generation constantly throughout the ages. God is constantly gifting his people. But God has given all of us different gifts according to the grace given us. See, it's, called a, it's even called a grace gift. It's, it's, it's a grace gift. It just means it's just grace. It's just, it's, it's, when you're doing it, it's easy for you. It's like my wife, uh, Pastor Veronica, she's, she's got this, you know, gift, you know, it's just easy for her. I see her developing teams and replicating people. She just does it like nobody else. I mean, raising teams up, raising people up, it's just a gift of hers. And, and she has this gift of hospitality, too. So, like, when you're around her, like, you know that girl loves you. Like, she genuinely loves you because she really does. But it's a gift that she has. For a season, she was gifted in kids' ministry. Like, she has just had a grace that was on her for kids' ministry. Now we have, like, these awesome kids' pastors and a kids' leadership team. I'm telling you, I could not do it. I could do it. If I was in there with your kids, I would need duct tape and a chair. That's what I would need. <laughs> I'm telling you, I just, you're going to listen to me, you know. <laughs> Aren't you glad I'm not that back there with your kids, you guys? I'm t- you don't want me back there. But why? 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 It's, it's just because I'm in my grace gift, they're in their grace gift, and together we're advancing God's purposes. You guys see that? So you need to find your gift. You need to discover the gift that God has given you. And again, that's what our next steps are all about. You, every other month, we help you identify it. The class is called Launch. We have a class every other month that we help teach you and help you identify and discover the gifts that God has placed in you. And see, once you do that, once you discover that, you are going to discover that God has more in your design than your hair color, your eye color, your 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 height and stuff like that. What you're going to discover, Psalm chapter 139, that God created your inmost being, your your inner parts like the desires you have god created the inner part of you to love what you love to cry about what you cry about you see things through the lens of your spiritual gifts so for some of you with the gift of helps you walk in even to here into this worship center and you see the chairs and you see the chairs you're like man they ought to be straightened here someone didn't someone needs to straighten these chairs up you know and that's what you see other people they, they walked into here and and, and saw someone who was kind of new, kind of off to themselves, and you were like, ooh, that, person's, that person needs, needs, needs to be welcomed or something. Two different people, same room. That's God's gifting. That, that's God, how God wired and created each unique person. For you created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's room. So this was planned in advance before you were even born. I praise you. This is David writing this. I think it's funny. David says, I praise you because I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. Man, you did a good job when you made me, God. Mm, I'm, I just see David. And by the way, this is easy for men to do. Men do this. But women, women have a hard time, you know, doing this. You, you, like a woman looks in front of the mirror and she always finds something that's wrong. 
with it, right? With, like what she's seeing, like it's, it's the hair, it's the outfit, it's just something. It's always something wrong. But you put a guy in front of that same mirror, and it don't matter if he looks like a tub of goo. He's like, oh, you wonderful boy. Come on, get you some of this. You know, this is David. I see David, he's like, oh, God. Now, I praise you, God, because you did a good job, man. You wonderful, God. You did good when you made me. Your works are wonderful. And then this last line, this last line, like David was able to say this. Some of you might not be able to say this, and I want you. I want you to be able. God wants you to be able to say this next line, which is, and I know them. I know it full well. I know your design on my life, God. I know how you made me. I know, I know it full well. I want you to be able to say that so bad, you guys. So, and the, uh, he says, all the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. Instead of that book that might be being written right now that you're writing that you know is not God's plan for your life. God has a book on your life. He has a plan and a purpose for your life. So write it down this way, not in your notes, but here's just a little statement I like to say. God's design in me reveals God's destiny for me. You want to know what you're, what you're here on this planet for? You want to know what your purpose is? Well, God's design in you reveals God's destiny for you. Your design reveals your destiny. And I want to help you with that. I want to help you find that. And then we go to this next step, the step two, and that is to develop the gifts God has given me. After we discover the gifts, we need to de develop the gifts. And, and a lot of you have, our, a lot of you know the gifts. We've had several, more than several hundred people, over 500 really have actually identified their spiritual gifting here at discovery and it's just it's it's a big part of who we are and what we do so a lot of you already know what your gifts are but but let me tell you something you may have never been told and that is that your gifts change and mature over time as you change and mature okay they will they will transform they will develop they will grow so for instance when you came to christ you may you may have got stepped into like making coffee or or handing out a welcome card or something like that. But then you started getting closer to Christ and God was building you up and you started, you started seeing your potential through God's eyes and he's maturing you. And now you, your capacity is changing. God is changing you. It's just like as we are, like in our regular age, you're like as a child, when you grow in your age, your abilities and maturity allows you to do some different things. And that's why you ought to do what the Bible says here in 1 Corinthians chapter 14. It says, follow the way of love. So make sure that's your motivation, not, not comparing, not competing. Follow the way of love, but eagerly desire the spiritual gifts. Like even the gifts you don't have. You, it, like you, one translation says, covet the spiritual gifts. Yeah, covet. Like the Bible is saying, like, like, like go after it. Ask God for those gifts. Like, look at those gifts and go, oh, God, oh, God, if you would give me that gift, if you let me have that gift, you put that in me, I would love to serve you with that. I would love to honor you, God, with that gift. If you would, oh, if you just give me that gift, I would love to make a difference for you, Jesus, with that gift. He says, eagerly desire those gifts. Now, I don't know where you're at. Maybe some of you have been pulled away, like you're for a season, have been not connected to your purpose, not connected to serving others in love and using the gift God has given you. But I need to tell you, please listen, you're never too far and it's never too late. You are never too far and it's never too late. Some of you may feel like you're on the sideline and you, know how to, you don't know how to get back in the game. You're never too far and it's never too late. Well, you may be, me, may be writing your own chapters right now. I know I wrote a few chapters in my book, okay? But God always, He can always make those final chapters fit. You're never too far and you're never too late. Develop the gifts God has given me. And I'm reminding you today, 2 Timothy chapter 1, I'm just hoping to fan into flames the gift of God. Like I believe the Holy Spirit today wants to breathe on your gifts. Wants to, that, those, those gifts that just may, may be dwindling down, like the, just the Spirit of God to blow on them again and to make that fire flame again, just the breath of God today in Jesus' name. Check it out, which is in you. To fan in the, like it's already in you. You have the gifts of God's Spirit. So together we can do this last thing, which is really what it's all about, and that is 
Number three, use the gifts God has given me. To use the gifts God has given me. Check it out. Listen, everybody. Everyone look up here. Look up here. If, it, if you don't know Jesus, if you don't know Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior, then your whole life is all about this discovery, this journey of, of discovering Jesus, of knowing him. Like maybe you're here today and you're on that journey. And you're like, I'm not sure about this thing. And I'm so glad that you're here. I'm not sure about God and this whole Christian thing and this Jesus thing. And look, your whole life before Jesus is about that. The Father is trying to orchestrate and, and, and get you to a place where you can actually receive him and believe him. Your whole life is about that. But listen, those of you who do believe in Jesus, meaning he's your Lord and he's your Savior, your whole life can be summarized in this one statement, to use the gifts that God has given you. That is your entire life. That is why we are here. It is why we exist as followers of Christ, to take every opportunity to do good, to reap the harvest, to accomplish the purpose of God that He's placed in our life. There is a mission. There is a, an assignment. Your gift comes with an assignment. Your whole life, if you know Jesus, is about this right here. It's to use the gift that God has given you to reap the harvest for His kingdom and His glory. Can I get an amen? 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 10 says that God has given gifts to each of you from His great variety of spiritual gifts. So here's, here's your part in that. Your part is manage them. Hey, be a good steward of that. God, God gave you that gift. He gave you difference making capacity and ingredients. Manage them well so that God's generosity can flow through you. Before me standing up here to you today, I just want to admit to you that the story that was being written that maybe I was writing from the book of my life, it should not have led to where I'm at today. The story that was being written when I was in grade school or when I was a teenager or when I was a young adult was, it, it should not have led to where I am today, but by the, but by the grace of God. I was, I was emotionally and physically bullied in my own home, the sixth child of seven kids. I was so insecure. I was looking for acceptance and, and love. I acted out in, in a lot of different ways. I was the guy in school that, that, that everyone knew that, that for the dare, I always took the dare, right? And if there was something to do, they'd be like, Jason will do it. Let's get Jason. Jason will do it. Because I was, I was just trying to like endear myself and have people accept me. And, and even after I accepted Christ, it was like it was only by revelation and God kind of working in my heart and in my mind that I was able ever to get free from that. So when I look at Discovery Church, you guys, I'm, I don't, I'm not proud like, wow. I'm amazed, because if you knew me like I knew me, you'd fall down and worship God right now. You would, because this has happened in spite of me. This is a miracle. It is impossible with who I am, but I can boldly stand before you today by the grace of God, filled with His Spirit, and tell you with confidence, I was made for this. I was made for this. This is why I exist. I, I want that for you so badly. So, so because of that, because of my story, I love, and our, whole, our church is designed to take people on a spiritual journey. Because I, 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 I can see the journey. I've been through that journey. It's all, our church is dying. I want to take you on a spiritual journey. And that spiritual journey is love God, love each other, change the world. So if you don't love, if you don't know God personally, and you're not in relationship with God, he's not, it's not real, a real personal, passionate relationship, then your first step is to love God, is to know Him. And then all of us have to deal with the fact that we've all been bullied. We all, we've all ha have had issues and, and habits and, and emotional things and, and, and hang-ups, and, and we need to get healing and freedom for those things. And so your next step after loving God is loving each other, because that's actually where you get your freedom. That's where you work out your freedom is in community, where you are accepted and where you belong, and it's in our small groups. And then I want to take you through these next step classes to help you discover your purpose so you can do what God has called you to do and gifted you to do to make a difference. You guys, you're not on this planet to just pay bills. You're not, you're not on this planet to raise 
kids and get them to behave. And you're not on this planet to go to work yet another Monday. There is more to this life. God has a purpose and an assignment for you so that he's gifted you, so that together we can change the world, so that together we can make a difference. So whether it's serving with kids or youth or behind the scenes or on the front lines, wherever it's at, you're to serve your gifts in love so that together we can make, we can make a difference. And my dream, my dream is that not to like fill up, I don't want to fill auditoriums and stuff, and I love reaching people and planting churches, and we're going to do that. But honestly, my dream, what at the, what's at the heart of all this is for you, every one of you, to go on this journey of loving God and loving each other and making a difference and changing the world and a lot, walking in the Spirit and letting Him work and flow through you to make a difference and to be able to one day say, here's your last feeling. Here's, I want you to be able to say this one day. I was made for this. I was made for for this, for you to actually stand in your assignment with the gifts that God has given you and for you to say, wow, I was made for this. That's why we do everything we do here at Discovery, to get you to that place where you can say that. That's my hope. With every head bow, every eye closed, let's go to God in prayer today.